Good afternoon, church. I hope you're doing well. Uh, this is Pastor Vic coming to you from Memphis, Tennessee this afternoon. I'm going to record a little video on how to lead a small group Bible study. This is really important. I've had some questions on it and should have recorded a video like this a long time ago because this is, this is the other crucial part of the church. What happens on the Sunday morning gathered worship service is one major, major essential part of the church and the other is small group Bible studies. Uh, the two together form what we're doing at the church and they, they play two different roles in what we're trying to accomplish at the church and both are necessary. So let me dive into this. Uh, leading a small group Bible study. Uh, the importance of it. So there is personal teaching. So there's teaching going on, interaction and relationships. Bible teaching, interaction, personal interaction and relationships. The interaction part is the teaching and the people asking questions and you answering questions. The relationship part and the asking questions and receiving answers is a part that cannot happen on Sunday morning. And if you're effective in your teaching and the preaching setting grows, it becomes harder and harder to where it becomes impossible to answer people's personal questions in a large preaching setting. So small group Bible studies are absolutely essential. And what's going to happen in the small group Bible study setting is we're going to be teaching, answering questions, and then prayer, individual prayer with people. I, I've just, to me, the, the best times of prayer are together with other people in a small group setting that you've been in with those people for long enough to know them and they will open their hearts up to you and you can open your heart up to them and you can earnestly pray together for matters that are important to both of you. And this happens over time in small group Bible studies. So I'm gonna go through this in, in, a, in a series of, of, of order, but uh, you know, not in any particular order. So let, let's just start with the setting. Where should you have a small group Bible study? I have led small group Bible studies in every setting imaginable. So I don't think it really matters, but there is one thing that does matter that will disqualify a setting, and that is the noise. You have to be able to hear each other. Often we'll meet in restaurants or cafes or something like that, but if it is so loud that, or the seating cannot be pulled together closely enough to where you can easily hear each other, you've got to find another setting. So the, some distraction that is so significant that it causes you not to be able to hear each other, that is the number one disqualifier for a setting. Other than that, it can be anywhere, somebody's house, somebody's dorm room, cafe, outside at a park, in a church, anywhere. So setting. Time. Time is very important. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about timing, especially in American culture. Time matters to people, especially if you're doing a workplace Bible study. Time really matters in that type of a setting. So in timing in general, I suggest that you meet at least every other week because what ends up happening is not everyone will be there every week. You as the leader should try to be there every week. We'll talk about times when you're not there later, but uh, not everyone else will be. And most people will make it about every other time. So if you only meet once a month, that the whole thing will fall apart. You cannot do a once a month small group because people will come every other month and it's not a priority in their life. And eventually the whole thing just uh, falls to pieces. So you need to meet every other week. My suggestion is that you meet every week. Uh, that's been the most fruitful studies I have are every single week studies and most of the people in the study will make it every other week but the people that are very passionate and really want to know and really want to grow they'll be there every single week and so I suggest you meet every week um, the time when in the day should you meet I suggest that you meet uh, early in the morning I, I, what ends up happening if you don't meet early in the morning is that you end up being uh, pushed out of the way by every other imaginable thing. People have busy schedules, they have class, they have kids, they have jobs, they have hobbies, they have whatever. Um, I know some people, some meet at night, some meet in the morning. Trying to do it in the middle of the day is basically impossible. It, it will just not work out. My suggestion is that if this is a workplace Bible study, that you do it uh, in the morning, early, before your work starts, before the work of the, of the whoever is coming uh, is normally going to have to be at work. 
If not, set it in the evening at a time after when most people would be uh, occupied with other things, maybe after dinner or something like that. Trying to push the most excuses possible out of the way. A major part about timing is do not chase people's schedule. Set a time, even if it's just you deciding on a time and inviting people to that, set a time and stick to the time. And you show up and whoever's gonna show up is gonna show up. And then people, if it's important to them, will begin to adjust their schedules around the time of the study, not vice versa. If you try to chase the time of the meeting, the meeting will fall apart because no one will ever be able to agree on the same time all the time. And by people prioritizing everything other than the small group Bible study, it says that that's the end of their priorities and they don't really care about it and they're not really gonna come anyway. So set a time and stick to the time. Um, I strongly suggest that you have the time, the official time of the Bible study be one hour. One hour for various reasons, but mainly attention span related to Bible teaching and everyone's ability to, uh, to come and coalesce around one hour. One hour tends to work very well. The breakdown of the hour should uh, be very specific, and uh, what, we, what I've had over time has worked very well, and I suggest that you try it and stick with it. So in the beginning of the hour, you begin on time. So whatever your set time is, you start at that time and tell people early on that's what you're going to do. It'll surprise people that you start on time. But when you start on time and you tell people that you're going to start on time, what ends up happening is people show up 30 minutes early because they know that the time set for the meeting is the start time of the meeting, not the time to start talking. So uh, press and enforce a on-time start time and begin with prayer. Uh, I encourage you early on to start with prayer, but then as you know if people in the group are comfortable with prayer, ask somebody to pray and ask the Lord's blessing upon the time. Because if God's Spirit does not bless the time and bless the meeting, you might as well not be getting together anyway. It's, it's got to be a work of the Lord, and so you're asking for His blessing on the time. Next, this is a Bible study. And so I'm going to get into that here in a little while, but I am going to very much urge you to be studying the Bible. The greatest life transformation for anyone will come from reading and studying God's Word, not reading a book about God's Word, not reading uh, a women's study book or a men's study book or uh, whatever. There are places and times for those things, but the mainstay of what you're doing should relate to reading and studying the Bible itself. And so in a Bible study, you should be reading the Bible. And so what you need to do is read the passage out loud. Uh, I think there's power in reading the Bible out loud. It's not often done, and I encourage you to do it every time. Whatever your passage is that you are reading and studying, that you either read it yourself out loud. I think better than that, though, is for you to uh, break it up and have people around the group read it out loud three or four verses at a time there will be many people in your group that have never read the bible out loud in their life and it will become transformative to them there will be some people in your group that have never read a passage of the bible in their life and they'll begin to be able to read and understand uh, the bible and just in case this is lost the main reason for studying the Bible is that over time, when we chapter by chapter, verse by verse study the Bible, it teaches people how to read and how to study the Bible for themselves. It demystifies the Bible to where they can begin to understand it and read it in their own devotions and have the Lord speak to them because they understand it. So you teaching it to them in a systematic way where they can ask questions helps them to understand it for themselves. So we're beginning on time, we're reading the scripture out loud, and then we're going to get into teaching. So the teaching portion of the Bible study should last 40 minutes approximately. And I, I, I would strongly suggest that you keep it that tight. You actually have a timekeeper. When I hit 40 minutes, when we hit 40 minutes, please tell me, and you're going to have a five-minute wind-down period so that at 45 minutes we're done with the Bible teaching portion of this. Now, we're going to get into how to teach here in a moment, but we're still talking about timing. 
After your wind down period, so at about the 45 minute mark, you're gonna stop and go to prayer. Now, why I say a hard stop is that if you don't have a hard stop, you won't stop. And so when you don't stop, you wind down, you say, oh, look, we've only got five minutes left. Oh, let somebody pray for us real quick and we'll be done. And prayer gets pushed out the backside and nobody ever actually prays for each other. Prayer is one of the essential things that you're doing in a small group Bible study. So it is essential that you get to that place. So that's why you've got to stop it. And when I say stop the Bible study portion, I mean, it can sometimes be like, all right, folk, we're at 45 minutes. We are done here. And you just end. There's no concluding sentence, no wrapping up thoughts. You're just, you're done. And we'll pick it up next week because we're going to be here next week. And you go to prayer. And so prayer, the way prayer should work in a small group study is you should have no more than five people praying for each other. So if you have five people, if you, let's say you have six people, break it into two groups of three. If you have 10, two groups of five. If you have 15, three groups of five. If you have more than 20 people in your small group, you really don't have a small group anymore, and you should have two small groups. But if you only have one teacher, at least break the small group down into four groups of five. And you should have approximately 15 minutes to pray. And that should be the, the small group of people asking each other how they can pray for each other and then actually pray for each other. And it should be that everyone that is willing to pray, prays. Now, what's gonna happen here with the prayer time and all the aspects of the small group Bible study is it's gonna start out with people not asking many questions and you being the main person talking and you being the main person praying. But after a few months together, all that's going to stop. And everyone will be asking questions and everyone will be talking. And it comes time to pray. Instead of people asking for prayer for other people, once they get to know each other, then people will begin to pray for each other. They will actually share real things going on in their lives, heartbreaking things. And they will begin to pray for each other in earnest and meaningful ways. And this is a very precious part of small group Bible studies. So the prayer time will naturally end with a small group of people like that in about 15 minutes. Uh, it, but you're not gonna really end the thing. It's gonna end when people are done praying for each other. But it should be at about an hour. And so what's gonna happen after that is it gives the freedom of people to, to leave. So there are gonna be people that need to go to class, people that need to go to work, people that have kids to take care of, whatever it may be. But then there's going to be other people to hang out for a while. Uh, if you're in a cafe or in somebody's home or wherever it may be, there's going to be people that stay for another hour because they have something they really need to talk about or something that's really on their heart. And that's fine. They can stay all day uh, because the time of the Bible study is over. And so what having this, this, this uh, careful or this kept time is it allows you to get to the business of studying the scriptures, asking questions, answering questions in prayer, and then has an open-ended time of discussion. I encourage you to remind people of the time of the study by putting out something, either a text chain or whatever messaging app that you use. Send something out the night before that says what you're going to be studying and the time that you're meeting and inviting them to be there and inviting them to invite a friend to be there. And together, those things will remind people to get up and be there, uh, and it will just help people because people just forget. They forget that it's meeting. Now, you can ask people, you know, in your list of people that you're inviting after a period of time, if you haven't seen person for a long time, to say, hey, do you want me to take you off this list? And I always get very interesting responses related to that. I, almost never do I have someone say, yes, please take me off that list. Often it's people say, you know, you know, it always reminds me and convicts me that I need to be there or no, I just haven't been able to make it or whatever it is. It, it allows you to engage a person that you haven't seen in a while in a non-confrontational conversation about Bible study and see how it goes. All right. So there is timing and that is just going to happen over and over and over and over again. And that's the joy of Christian discipleship, is that the newness of this comes from the living, fresh nature of God's Word and God's Spirit speaking to our hearts, not doing something new in Bible study. It's not a, it's not a game. It's not a, it's not a gimmick that you're trying to sell to people. 
It's the reality of God's Word and God's Spirit impacting people's lives right where they are, week after week, day after day, year after year. Now, some small groups take a break during seasons, and that may make sense for you, or it may not make sense to you. for you. I encourage you, after you've been going for some months, to ask the people of the Bible study, do you want to take a break for a period of time? If you're in school and, and you have semester schedules, that's obviously going to make sense. But the workplace Bible studies that I've been a part of never took a break because the people didn't want to stop seeing each other. It was a very important part of their life. So just poll the people, do what makes sense. Let's talk about preparation. Preparation in studying uh, the Bible and preparation in leading a small group Bible study. If you are starting out leading a small group Bible study, I really encourage you to start with the gospel. The, the heart of the Bible is Jesus Christ. He is the center of all things in the scriptures. And understanding Jesus and, and who he was and what he taught is absolutely essential to a person growing in their faith and coming to know Christ as their Savior at all. And so just don't take for granted that the people in your Bible study know anything about Jesus. One of the things that you should absolutely never say, really in, in any church setting, but especially in a small group setting is, oh, I assume everybody here already knows this, but I'm gonna go over it anyway. That just makes people feel stupid. And don't assume that people know anything. Assume that you're te like you were when you first came to Jesus and you just knew nothing about the Bible. Teach the Bible that way and it will help people grow in their faith the most. And so I encourage you to start with the Gospel. Um, I know many people start with the Gospel of John, but the Gospel of John has more depth of teaching, more depth of doctrine to it. I find that starting with the Gospel of Luke is the most helpful because it gives the fullest picture of the life of Christ and lots of good doctrine in the midst. And uh, just for America, it seems like the Gospel that helps people come to understand Christ the most and the quickest. And then we go to the Gospel of John second after they understand generally who Jesus even is. And then we can learn about what he taught and the nature of his ministry. But um, the Gospel of, Gospel of Luke, don't get bogged down, keep moving. Many people have questions about all kinds of things and that's great, but if you take two months to get through the first chapter of Luke, it's going to be difficult because you'll never reach the end of Luke. It'd take you five years to get to the end of the Gospel of Luke. If you're in a small group Bible study that's meeting regularly, you want to get to the end of the Gospel of Luke by either two semesters or two sessions of meetings or a year of meeting. And so you've got to look at it that way and probably get through you know, a good half a chapter, or maybe the really long chapters of Luke, a third of the chapter, each time that you're together. And so you are going to look at aspects of each chapter, but you're never going to be able to exhaustively answer every question or look at everything every time, and that's fine. So keep moving a good section at a time. So how do you prepare for this? How do you prepare as a teacher to teach the Bible in a small group setting? Perhaps you've never taught the Bible before and you've always used a book or some prop because it scares you to death to teach the Bible. How do I go teach anybody the Bible? So here's the basics of how to prepare a small group Bible study and teach other people the Bible. First, surprise, surprise, read the Bible. And so you're going to take the passage that you've selected and you're going to read it through and then you're going to work to outline it. I need to do another video on this, do that later, but I, let me give you the basics, and that is that you you have to understand the passage that you are reading, and you're going to teach like, the setting of where it is, who is speaking, what historically is happening, and the basic interactions of the passage, so that you have a concept of what is going on there. And that's going to involve cross-referencing, especially in the New Testament. So if an Old Testament character is mentioned, if an Old Testament passage of Scripture is quoted, you have to cross-reference that, which means you've got to go to the Old Testament and you've got to look at what is happening there in the Old Testament and understand who those characters are and where that passage was quoted from. If uh, there are other things referenced in that passage, you've got to look them up and, and figure it out. You're going to write out notes. Literally, this is not all up here. Get out a notebook, 
that it's, or a computer, whatever you use, whatever works for you, and you are making notes while you are reading, and you are physically outlining this thing to grasp what is happening. You're going to have to spend some money and buy a study Bible. I highly encourage you to buy the full English Standard Version Study Bible, the ESV Study Bible, an incredible one-volume resource that is a doorstop of a book. It's thousands of pages long, but it's incredibly accessible and helpful, and it has all kinds of notes in it. But we're not looking at notes yet. You are doing your own work to understand what is going on yourself to the very best of your ability before you look at the notes of other people. Now, if you can't, if you can't not cheat and look down at the bottom at the notes, then get another Bible that only has cross references in it and no notes and do your own work first and really try to figure out who is go who is there and what is happening and what is the setting and what is Jesus talking about and then go to your ESV study Bible notes and look at the bottom. And it'd be interesting because if you've done your homework, you should be pretty close to what's in the notes down at the bottom. If you're wildly off, then you got a ways to go. But by doing your own work first, it will help you in grasping what is being said by other people. You don't want to go straight to what other people are saying first because you, you will not learn as much for, without doing your own work. But after you've done your own work, you're going to start reading notes. Read the notes at the bottom of the study Bible. And I encourage you to go buy a good commentary on the Gospel of Luke. I particularly enjoy the Pillar Commentary series, um, New Testament Commentary series. It'll be a one volume book that'll probably cost you 20 or $30, but you can use it for a year as you reference it. There'll be a lot there in these chapters, more than is at the bottom of the ESV. Uh, another great commentary, old school, but I, to me, there's no school like the old school. People that served and loved Jesus their whole lives and their works are still in print a hundred years later because they've been valuable to Christians for hundreds of years. There's something there. Um, J.C. Ryle, R-Y-L-E, Expository Thoughts on the Gospels, the, the, uh, ver the um, volume on Luke, I think is also outstanding. Uh, there's a whole set of uh, the Gospels uh, with uh, Ryle's commentary there. But once you have read the scriptures and read some notes, your time, like some days you're going to have more time, some days you're going to have less time. But you've got to make some time to do your own study and some time to read the notes. You cannot come in just completely uh, unprepared. It's no good. Even if that means staying up late at night or getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning, you have got to be prepared to the best extent that you possibly can be. I'll say more about that in a moment. But after making some preparation and reading, you've got to pare down what's there. There's always, always going to be more to cover than you can possibly cover. So with the section that you have chosen, that's going to keep you moving, whether it's a half a chapter, third of a chapter, whatever it may be, you're going to choose two to three points, two to three aspects of that chapter that you feel like are meaningful, really meaningful. And after you've read the whole thing, then you're going to go, all right, we're now going to go to this point. This area right here is very important, and this is what we're taking. And you're going to teach some on that point, maybe five, six, maybe ten minutes at the absolute most to teach what is happening in that first important passage. And then you're going to open it up for questions. And you're gonna ask the questions, you're gonna frame the questions. Questions like who, what, when, where, why questions. What is going on here? Why did Jesus say this? Who is speaking? Why do you think Jesus said this? Those are the questions you're looking for, discussion-oriented questions, not yes-no questions, and not the worst question of all that should never, ever, ever be asked in a small group Bible study setting, and that is, what does this passage mean to you? No, that is never the right question, because the question is not what does the passage mean to you, it's what does the passage mean? What did the author, inspired by the Holy Spirit, mean when they were writing this passage? And if it means something wildly different to you, you are wrong, because the passage has a meaning. It has a grammatical and historical meaning. The historical meaning intended by the author is in that historical setting 
What was the author trying to say? And the grammatical part of it is that words have meaning. And if your meaning drawn from the passage has nothing to do with the setting, the context, the history, or the grammar, then your meaning is wrong. And yes, there will be people that have wrong answers to the question that you ask. And there is an art to, but there must be courage by you to say, I'm sorry, but that's wrong. And you can say it in a kind way, in a loving way, but you cannot have people give answers that are wrong and then affirm those answers. That's part of teaching. Part of teaching is correcting people when they are off track. So now you can definitely say and should say, how does this passage apply to you? Once we have established the meaning of the passage, then we can begin to look at how does the meaning apply to our cultural setting and your life in particular. And the application can be very wide, but the meaning will be very narrow. Okay, takeaways from teaching. Number one, you will always learn more than everybody in the small group Bible study by your own preparation for teaching. If you want to grow in discipleship, begin teaching. Because when you take preparation seriously, it will launch you into discipleship. Because taking seriously, teaching the Bible to other people means serious preparation on your part. Secondly, don't be afraid to not have the answer for all the questions. There will be many times where people ask you a question and you say, I just, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Let me go research that, work that out, and I'll try to come back next week with an answer for you. And then you go to do some research. Uh, phone a, a friend, a, a person that's further along in the Lord than you are to help you answer those questions. When you ask questions in a small group Bible study, wait for answers. Waiting in silence can be very uncomfortable, especially when you first start and you need people to talk the most. But wait when you ask a question. If no one answers, then suggest an answer. Well, perhaps, you know, Jesus meant this. Think about this. Uh, how about that? Or you, know, you throw some potentials out on the table, see if anyone bites. If no one says anything, then you just keep going. Over time, when you get to know people better, you should call on people. If people you know have a good answer and they're wise people, say, hey, tell me about this. What do you think about that? Tell me what you think about why God said this or who this person is. And really over time, once you get to know people and there are particularly quiet people in the study, I encourage you to call on them and say, brother or sister, tell me, tell me what you think about this. When you know that it's not going to embarrass them, they're just quiet people for one reason or another. It takes time for community to develop in a small group Bible study. And so let that community develop over time. Don't rush it. Keep asking the questions. Keep letting there be silence. Keep letting people talk. But don't just do all the talking yourself. That is not ever an effective small group Bible study when you're doing all the talking yourself. I think you should probably be doing about half the talking and other people doing about half the rest of the talking. And it may be more than that in the beginning when people aren't comfortable with each other. But once people get comfortable with each other, then it should be about 50-50. An important rule to this, though, is don't let the talker dominate. There will be a talker in your group. I, I just guarantee it. it always happens that way. One person that just feels like they want to answer every question and dominate everything. It will destroy your small group if you don't control that person. If the person can't take a hint, then soon after you realize that their over talking is dominating the group, you need to get with that person offline, outside of the group, before the group, after the group, in a private meeting, sometime else during the week, and address it and say, brother or sister, this, this is a problem. I, I need you to allow other people to speak in the group. When you answer every question, I appreciate your zeal, but every time you answer, it allows the other person not to answer and no one else is getting the chance or not enough people are getting the chance to talk in this group. And I'm asking you to please have the self-control to not answer every question. And if a person is true and earnest, because there's different people in this camp, some people are just proud and they want to talk all the time and they're not going to listen to you and they're going to keep talking all the time anyway. And that's another issue to address. But some people are just earnest. They're just eager. And so they may not then, they, they may not speak at all the next time because they're concerned about over speaking. 
And so in that situation, you can call on them and you'll, you'll work it back and forth until they figure out what the right balance is. If you do truly have a group dominator and the issue is pride, which is a sin, then you're gonna have to, a whole other video on how to deal with uh, issue, sin issues in a small group, but I'll let you figure that one out. Um, end on time. So in the discussion, in the talking, uh, again, end on time. People will, after time, after a while, they'll just begin to love your meeting together. They'll, they'll have such a great time together, and if your teaching is effective, it will draw people out. End on time, though. Don't press out your time of prayer. The time of prayer is as important or more important than whatever you might feel like you need to say to get into 10 more minutes of already having 45 minutes of talking. Um, at the end of the Bible study for the week, you need to be able to discern when does it make sense to move on to the next passage and when does it make sense to remain where you are and pick up right there and go into the next week. I would say that most of the time you should be going on to the next passage so that you can make movement, like I said earlier. But there are going to be times where some topic was so important and people had so much to say that you just could not get to it all that time. Begin in the same place the next Bible study and just pick it up right from there. Remind people, last week we were talking about this and we're gonna pick up right there. Yeah, you know, whoever said this and here we go, let's dive right back in. Um, well, we're talking about preparation and leading. I can tell you, you will not ever have enough time to prepare. Every time I prepare for a small group or especially when I prepare for a sermon, I, I get to the end of it, I've written out my notes, I've done the very best I can, and I feel completely inadequate for the task that's before me, and you're gonna feel exactly the same. The elders in our church, we have this saying of the loaves and fishes. Uh, the parable, the wonderful parable of Jesus uh, feeding the 5,000 was a test to the disciples. He asked them, you feed these people. And they said, we can't possibly feed these people. We don't have the, we can't feed these people. Well, I can tell you, every time you go to preach and teach uh, in a small group setting, it, it's, it's like a test because you can't possibly shepherd these people. You can't possibly teach them what they need to know. And so you do the very best you can. You bring to the table your loaves and fishes. You bring to the table the best you have and you offer it to the Lord. And so your preparations are not complete until you have spent time in prayer. So when you finish your notes, you close your Bible, you close the books, you get down on your knees, quite literally, if you have a place to do that, and ask God to bless the Bible study. Ask him to bless your time and preparation to lead your words, to be present at the time of meeting. Pray for the people by name that the Lord would be at work in their hearts, bringing them to salvation or growing them in their discipleship. Give the time and yourself to the Lord. If you have sin in your heart, you need to confess your sins uh, before you go to lead a, Bible, a small group Bible study. You can't possibly have known, unconfessed sin eating away your heart and then go and lead a Bible study. The Lord's not going to bless that. So confess your sins. Seek a pure heart, for the pure in heart shall see God. Pray for radical life change and seek radical life change. I have seen just incredible life change in people over periods of months and years. And part of that life change is going to come from people that are under your leadership and teaching for months to a year, and then you, you have absences and you see growth in that person's life, and you say, hey, here, I, I want you to lead this Bible study when I'm gone. You can pass this video to them, you can tell them what we're saying here on their own, give them some clear direction, but then let them go and teach. You have to get other people involved. This is how the group will multiply. If God's blessing it, eventually the group will grow, and it will grow beyond 15 people, and you will need to give uh, other people a chance to teach so that another group can begin in some other place and some other time. This is the multiplying nature of discipleship and the work of God in the church. And so give someone else a chance that the group might multiply. Well, I hope this has been helpful to you. Um, you can write comments, questions in the box. I'll do the best I can to answer those things. You can ask me in person. And together we'll go forward leading small group Bible studies that the great commission of Jesus Christ might be fulfilled in making disciples throughout the earth. God bless you.